maybe that's for him. So just a quick word about that. We are students for Liberty. We are the international organization uh, for students mostly. And we are promoting ideas of liberty, economic of freedom, philosoph uh, philosophy, and all of that. So thank you for your attention. That's all for me, hopefully for the rest of the, the day. And uh, I will leave the word to Mr. Mr. Brock. Thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you. I, I guess uh, I'm supposed to introduce myself. I, I don't know, but uh, uh, I, I thought everybody knew who I was, but I guess not because he asked where I'm from. So, uh, <laughs> obviously, obviously, they don't know who I am. Uh, so, my name is Yaron Brook. I, uh, I'm the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. Hopefully you've heard of Ayn Rand, uh, but if not, uh, do we have books? Um, I don't think we do, actually. Okay, we don't have books, but you can look her up online. Um, and uh, there's actually a program at the Ayn Rand Institute where you can get some of her books for free, downloaded. Uh, so if you, yeah, there's a book, somebody has a book, that's good. Um, but uh, but you, can download, you can download a book for free if you're a student. Uh, and uh, we do have a student conference coming up uh, in Athens uh, that you can also apply for a scholarship. Oh, we've got, we've got two more additional people coming. Um, or one person and one semi-person. Um, and uh, so, uh, as I said, I, I run the Ayn Rand, so I'm the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, I, uh, for those, uh, I live in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, which is uh, in the Caribbean islands, and uh, which has the uh, amazing advantage that if you're an American citizen and if you structure your income in the right way, you basically pay no taxes. Um, uh, so it's it's uh, it's the one it's the one um, tax advantageous place that an American citizen could take advantage of uh, other places. You're screwed if you're an American, you have to pay, you have to pay even in Monaco or places like that, Americans don't work. Puerto Rico, it works, so I live there, uh, which, is, uh, which is a huge benefit, a huge benefit. Uh, let's see, what else do you want to know about me before we talk about capitalism? Anything you want to know? How many of you know, or let me ask you, how many of you have um, read something by Ayn Rand. All right, uh, so about half of you. Um, all right, uh, let's do this. We're gonna, we're gonna talk, we'll talk about uh, the mall case for capitalism, which is what we promised to talk about, but uh, let's in the Q&A, somebody asked me about Ayn Rand, who she was, what she was, and uh, why she was important, and why I think you should read her. Because uh, I want, I want when we leave, I want you guys to be excited, enthused about uh, about going and picking up uh, one of Ayn Rand's books and reading it. And uh, what language do you have in Slovakia? Slovakian? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, her books, I think, are translated into Slovakian. They are. Into Czech. But, uh, into Czech. Okay. I, okay. I thought there was a translations, local translations. Okay, so in Czech, you're gonna have to play second fiddle. I'm sure it's not the only time uh, that, uh, that you've had to tolerate Czech. Uh, all right, so how many of you consider yourself libertarians? Free market, something? You, libertarian, objectivist, free market, something on that. You know, we've got one who isn't, okay? We've got an eye on him. Um, <laughs> kidding. Um, so, um, so the first thing to note about uh, capitalism or free markets, and I'm going to use capitalism primarily to denote free markets. We'll get into maybe a more technical definition of what I mean by capitalism later. But just for now, let's just assume capitalism equals free markets. And one thing, one thing we, we know, one thing uh, there is a ton of evidence for any one of us who has researched it, done, studied a little bit, studied history, studied economics, there's one thing we absolutely know, and that is that free markets work. In the sense of creating wealth, uh, you know, providing prosperity, raising people's standard of living, 
bringing people out of poverty. The reality is that markets work. All you have to do really is, is look around the world. All you have to do is look a, bit, a little bit at history. Look at what happens in countries that are not capitalist or not free market oriented and move just a little bit in the direction of free markets, right? Because we know there's no country in the world that's a pure free market. But if a country just moves in the direction of free market, what happens? Incomes goes up, wealth goes up, productivity goes up, people make more money. I mean, from a material wealth perspective, we know that capitalism generates results. I mean, you live in a place that used to be, not that long ago, communist. And you know what happened when you got rid of communism and you haven't exactly got capitalism in, uh, over here. We don't have capitalism in America, but it's freer than it was. And as a consequence, you're wealthier. Uh, you know, the economy is doing better, you produce more, there's innovation, there's, a, from a, again, material perspective, everything is better off. And this is not unique to, to communism or to this part of the world or to Europe. This is true of uh, China. China goes from uh, completely Maoist, where everything is dictated and everything is controlled and everything is centrally planned, to a little bit of freedom in parts of China, and what happens? Those parts that are left a little bit free explode in terms of wealth, creativity, dynamism, everything. So we know that if we, if we provide people with freedom, if we liberate economies, which means getting rid of government control, getting rid of central planners, then what happens, wealth is created and standard of living goes up. And this is true no matter where in the world you try it. And we've tried all kinds of things, all kinds of systems of authoritarianism and all kinds of systems of a little bit of freedom here and there. And it always works when you clamp down, when you restrict, when you centrally plan, when you control, you fall off a cliff, things get worse. And when you liberate, things get better. And the more you liberate, the more freedom you allow, the richer people are, the, the more prosperous people are. And again, it doesn't matter where in the world. Uh, you know, my favorite example is Hong Kong. Not a good example anymore. Used to be pre-2020 when China basically took it over. And who knows where it's going to go in the future. But Hong Kong was, you know, one of the most amazing places on planet Earth. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been there. But if you haven't, you might never experience it again because things have changed so much. But it used to be the most dynamic, exciting place with, filled with energy. Um, it's a tiny little rock. It's an island, in, but, but it's rocky. Yet it's got more skyscrapers than New York City. Seven and a half million people live on the rock. Seven and a half million people live in one little place. And the per capita GDP, so level of wealth, same as the United States. And they did it all in 70 years. They went from a fishing village to the most, one of the most dynamic cities on planet Earth. What did the government do? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. Protected property rights, contract law, stable currency, and left the economy, left it alone. No welfare state, no socialized health care, no central planning, no dictates in the economy. And the thing just took off. So the bottom line, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you guys are all free market guys, so you know this, guys and gals, so you know this, right? In, in America, particularly in uh, Texas, where I spent a few years, guys denotes everybody. So, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to remember that I'm not in Texas anymore. Um, So free markets work. And we understand why they work. That is, we know the economics of it. We know the incentive structure of it. We understand how economics work and why free markets actually produce the results. We, we've all read Hayek and Mises and Friedman and whoever else you read, right? We've read The Economist. We know the process by which markets operate and why they work the way they work. Free market economists have won Nobel, uh, Nobel Prizes in economics. They've, they, they, they're well-regarded in a lot of universities. 
they've done well. There are a lot of them. It's not just a few people here and there. A lot of universities in, in the West have free market economies. We get it. So we have a combination of capitalism works. We understand why it works, because economically at least. And yet, in spite of all this, the real question we have to ask ourselves is, why are we failing? Why hasn't the world embraced free markets? Why is generally the world moving away from them? Even in a place like Slovakia, where for a period you were moving away from communism towards free markets, that stopped, I assume, and you're sliding maybe backwards. And if not here, I know other places where they're sliding backwards. Almost everywhere in the world, free markets don't have a great reputation. Almost everywhere in the world, people are banning free markets, abandoning capitalism, particularly young people. I mean, if we were running right now a session on why capitalism is immoral, there would be a lot more people here. A lot more people here. I mean, you couldn't keep them in the, you know, they'd be flooding all over the place. Socialism is cool. The reality is that the anti-free market position among young people is much cooler much sexier, much more people are much more passionate about. You get you you do a talk on Marx, fill the auditorium. Why? If our system works, and we understand why it works, you can explain it. We've got good economists who've been explaining it for decades. Why is every country in the world, including the United States? including the little bit of freedom they gave the Chinese, all slipping backwards, all moving away from us. And this is true everywhere in the world. There's, there, there's no, I mean, there's some countries that are moving a little bit towards capitalism, but nobody's embracing it. Nobody's excited about, and you don't see passion around capitalism the way you see passion around socialism. And this should be the most important question that Students for Liberty and other organizations ask themselves. What is it about capitalism that those people out there find so offensive and that they vote time and time again and they endorse and they propagate ideas that are anti-capitalist? What is it about capitalism that they find offensive, that they find bad, that they can't support? And at the end of the day, I think the answer is not that they don't understand particular economic ideas because we've explained them and we're good at explaining them. You know, we've got Milton Friedman's videos up on YouTube. He's very good at explaining economic ideas, right? And you can explain to people a million times why minimum wage causes unemployment and it doesn't matter one iota, they still vote for minimum wage. Right? They'll find a couple of obscure studies where supposedly it shows that minimum wage, raising minimum wage doesn't matter or rent control or any, or any socialist policy, any central planning policy. Right? The solution always to a crisis Whatever the crisis is, is what? Print more money, more government, more controls, more of the things that got us into the crisis, right? That got us into the problem. So, I don't think the answer is going to lie in economics. And I don't think the answer lies in politics. And I don't think the answer lies in we need to better understand history. We do, and we should learn more economics and all that. All that is important. But the reality is, None of that, none of that is what is actually preventing, was actually causing people to have such a resistance, such a negative view of the capitalist system. So the real question is, why are we failing? And, and we have to acknowledge we're failing. It, it, Students for Liberty, I've been around since Students for Liberty was started. I've been watching. And the audiences have not grown. And we don't have bigger audiences. And we haven't taken over it. Slovakia, and we haven't taken over the Czech Republic, we haven't taken over anyway. The two seats up front here, but they're also back there, so whatever you guys want. All right. <laughs> Something happened there, I don't know what. He sent me away. He sent you away, okay. So here's the problem with capitalism, or, or let me ask it a different way. What is capitalism fundamentally about? What, what are markets about? What, why do we engage in markets? Why do we enter uh, into marketplaces? What's the purpose of a marketplace? 
to provide, to provide for our needs. I mean, that's one direction, right? Because a marketplace is more than just me wanting stuff. Uh, so when, when, when Steve Jobs makes an iPhone, right? You've seen this, right? So when, when Steve Jobs makes an iPhone, why does he build the iPhone? What, you know, who is he doing this? What, what's the purpose of this? Why is he selling iPhones? What's that? Yeah, no, but people, nobody demands it, right? I, I was there. You guys weren't born yet, probably. But I was there before there was an iPhone. And I didn't know I demanded an iPhone. I didn't demand an iPhone. I didn't know an iPhone existed. And I, if you told me there was an iPhone, I would have said, yeah, I don't know if I want all that. I mean, I literally said that about cell phones. Like when cell phones came out, the first cell phones, you remember those flip phones or whatever? Or the big ones, they were, they were big like this. And I, and I was like, I don't want a phone. Like, I have a phone at work. I have a phone at home, so what, I need a phone when I drive from home to work? What do I need a phone for? So I, I refused to buy a cell phone. And then my wife was driving, we lived in Northern California back then, and my wife was driving, had a long drive to San Francisco and back home, and she would come home sometimes late at night. So she said, okay, we'll buy one phone for her at night when she drives back, just in case, you know, we weren't demanding cell phones, we, we did them a favor and bought one. Of course, once you buy one and you discover, this is cool. <laughs> then we had like two and then we had three and then every kid got one and you know, then it, then it explodes and then they come up with this and then everybody wants it. So it's, it, it's not because we demand it. I mean, this is one of the fallacies in economics. Demand doesn't drive supply. Indeed, it's supply that drives demand or the two sides of the same coin in a sense. But one thing, one, one of the main things entrepreneurs do is they teach us what we should demand. Steve Jobs comes out with this and he says, this is wonderful, you should want one. And we go, whoa, yeah, I want one. But not before he said it, not before he showed me, not before he taught me. All right, that was a sidetrack. Why did Steve Jobs make this? To make a profit. To make a profit, certainly. Uh, these things had and still have very high profit margins. So Steve Jobs makes a lot of money. But is it only about the money? What, what is another reason Steve Jobs would want to make this? Yeah. Technological progress? Yeah, but why does he care about technological progress? Or, 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 technological progress is, is kind of an abstract thing. What, why did Steve Jobs do it? It makes people's lives better. It makes other people's lives better, but like well, Steve... Well, okay, maybe one's a problem, it solves a problem. So, so why do you guys, I mean, I don't know how many of you work, but why do you guys go to work? Yeah, I mean, he loved doing this. Like, he wanted to create something beautiful. He wanted to create something in his image. He wanted to create something that was obviously useful because he wanted to make money. That's one of the prerequisites, right? But he, he loved designing great products. Hopefully, you love your job, and you go to work not only to get a wage, but also because you love what you do. Not everybody does, but Steve Jobs did. So Steve Jobs designed the iPhone for... Steve Jobs, because he loved it and because it was going to make him a lot of money. So he goes into the marketplace trying to make money and, and trying to perpetuate his love. And I remember going into the marketplace in, it was 2008, and buying my first iPhone. Um, and the U.S. economy was, was declining. We're going into a recession. It was a great financial crisis. And we're going into a recession. And I, I've, I'd studied my Keynes and knew that, you know, if you want to get the economy going when you go into a recession, you have to stimulate, you have to, you have to consume. So I went to buy the iPhone because I wanted to help the U.S. economy grow. I wanted to help my fellow man. I wanted to make sure jobs were kept because I know that's why you guys should go shopping. You go shopping in order to make sure people have jobs. And, uh, and why are you laughing? Isn't this good? Um, of course not, right? Why do we go shopping? To meet our, you said it earlier, to meet our needs, desires, wants. I wanted an iPhone. Why? Because I thought it would make me more productive, because I thought it would be fun, because I thought it would be cool, because I thought I would benefit from it. So what are marketplaces? Marketplaces in which, are places in which people come to pursue what? Exchange for the purpose of what? What's that? Fulfilling their needs, simpler. What's a simpler term for that? To pursue their self-interest. 
They go into the marketplace in order to pursue what they think at that point in time is good for them. It's the marketplace and capitalism are systems in which people engage in activities because they believe it's in their self-interest. We build stuff, we create stuff because we like to, because we want to, and because we profit from it. We consume stuff because we want to, we like to, because we believe we will profit. It will make us happier, it will make us better. It will make us cooler, it will make us look better, whatever it happens to be. We just like beautiful things, so we buy beautiful things. Right? Whatever it happens, but it's me. Me, me, me. And you, 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 right? And we exchange, and the beauty of exchanges, the beauty of trade, is that we can exchange. I can give Apple $1,000, get an iPhone, and who lost? Apple gained $500 because their profit margin is about 50%. How much did I gain? What's that? One iPhone. One iPhone, but how much did I gain from that iPhone? More than $1,000. Or euros or whatever it happened to be, right? More. We know that. How much more? I mean, I can tell you can't tell, you don't know, right? Only I know how much I gained. That's one of the problems in economics that what they call consumer surplus, you can't measure. Right? But I can tell you, this thing is worth to me tens of thousands of dollars for a variety of reasons that have to do with everything I can do with this. Don't tell Apple. I don't want them to raise my price. Uh, so it's a win-win transaction, but the essential characteristic of it is that it's self-interested. Now, what did our mothers and preachers and philosophers teach us about self-interest. Good thing? Morally, from an ethical perspective. Is self-interest a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. bad. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I, you know, my mother was uh, very Jewish. So my mother taught me, think about this first. Think of yourself last. Always other people. They're the most important thing. Sacrifice for other people. That's the standard. That's good morality. Now, she didn't mean it because she wanted me to do well, and to do well, I bet I have to think for my, about myself. But that's what we say to everybody. Morality is about other people. It's about making their lives better. It's not about yourself. And indeed, another term for morality often is be selfless. Be selfless. And if you're selfless, that's virtue. That gets you into heaven. That's a positive view of life. Right? Are you selfless in capitalism? Is anybody selfless in the marketplace? No. I, I, you know, I don't say, okay, I, I feel like sacrificing today, so I'll overpay. A whole mentality, and, and we live these dual lives, I think. A whole mentality is, no, I want to get a good deal. I want, to, I, want to, I want to benefit myself. I want to be better off after I transact rather than worse off. But sacrifice, morality in our minds is, oh, I have to be worse off after I transact. It's not about me. It's about somebody else. And if I'm worse off, I've shown that I am moral. I am good. I mean, indeed, the, the, the secular advocates for, 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 for this kind of morality, whether it's Augustine Comte, the French philosopher, or Kant, the German philosopher, would say that if you approach an act to help somebody else and you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to enjoy helping them, I get satisfaction out of help, not a moral act anymore. Because you brought your self-interest into it. To be really moral, they tell us, it has to be selfless. How does capitalism fit into that? It doesn't. It doesn't. The motivation of everybody in capitalism, even though other people are better off because of capitalism, we'll get to that in a minute, right? You are also better off. And you were motivated by be being better off. So it takes it out of morality. The real problem capitalism has is that it fundamentally goes against everything we have been taught about ethics, about morality. It's counter to morality. It's immoral. And that's what everybody believes. They all like 
to, to, to transact. They all like the standard of living going up, but what do they like more? Feeling like they're good people. Morality always, in the long run, trumps economics. And if people think a system is immoral, a system is wrong, they won't embrace it. Or they certainly won't embrace it fully. They'll embrace it a little bit to satisfy their desire for stuff. And they'll always feel like, yeah, we need a little bit of capitalism because we need to live, right? We need a little bit of capitalism because we want to have the good stuff, but not too much because it's immoral. And we can't have that. I mean, Adam Smith had a sense of this in the, in the Wealth of Nations, and he also wrote a book called um, uh, Moral Sentiments. Uh, and he writes, you know, the baker, when he bakes the bread, doesn't care about you, right? He doesn't know who you are. He's not baking the bread for the consumer. He doesn't know the consumer. Why is he baking the bread? Yeah, to make money, to make a living. He has to feed his family, feed himself. And hopefully, like Steve Jobs, he enjoys making bread. He has fun doing it. Right? The grocery store that sells you the bread is not doing it for you. It's doing it because they need to make a living. And you, when you buy the bread, are not buying it for them. You're buying it for yourself. So Adam Smith understood that the economy is driven by self-interest. But he also writes that self-interest is, eh, it's not a virtue, it's not noble, it's not moral, it's not good. So he says, but, he says, yes, for an individual to pursue his self-interest is not moral or good, but when you aggregate all the self-interested actions that people take in a society, the sum of it leads to a better society, so cool, it's good. In other words, if you add up vices, add up negatives, you get a positive. Now, it's true, negative plus negative is a bit, but nobody believes that in the world. Let's say if I'm bad and bad and bad and bad, somehow it all adds up to I'm good, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. But that's the best we have to defend capitalism. Can we get to that afterwards? Okay. So, so you're challenging the whole concept of capitalism. We'll get to that in a minute. I've got a great answer for sweatshops. Okay. You might have seen it online. So I'll, I'll try to replicate that because it was good. Um, so, so, so that's step one. And again, we'll, we'll deal with the, are there some people who are not better off under capitalism in a minute. So capitalism is viewed by the culture as negative. I mean, think of it, think of it this way. Um, and it's not because of capitalism doesn't help people. So take, take a Bill Gates, right? And, and before COVID, so forget all the conspiracy theories about Bill Gates <laughs> since COVID. Let's pretend they don't exist and pretend some of you don't believe them and, and just focus in on Bill Gates builds Microsoft. And he makes billions of dollars for himself. And in building Microsoft and making billions of dollars for himself, what impact did he have on the world? On like pretty much everybody in the world. What? Huge. Positive. Huge. Right. People, his dream, right, with the mission statement for Microsoft in the early days was, anybody know what it was? A computer on every desk. Beautiful mission statement. What did they achieve? A computer on every desk, pretty much. On the planet, not in a country. So they changed everybody's lives. Now, how do we know they changed their lives for the better? Because people keep buying Microsoft products. They keep paying the money. And if I, just like I paid $1,000 for the iPhone and my life got better, we know that when people buy a product, their life gets better, otherwise they wouldn't do it. Bill Gates made the world a better place for hundreds of millions of people, actually billions of people. Everybody on planet Earth has been touched by Bill Gates, almost everybody. Even if you're really, really poor in Africa and you don't have computers, but you get aid, charities, bring in food, guess how the, guess how the charities can be efficient and, you, and get their supply chain right and get you the food on time and, and at a low cost? How do they, how do, they do that? 
using computers, using, using all the logistics, and using all the technology that people like Bill Gates made possible. So Bill Gates made the world a better place for billions of people. How much moral, moral, not economic, how much moral credit did he get for that? Do we think of him as a moral hero? Are, we, are, are they naming streets after him and building statues? I would say not just not a lot, I would say he got some negative. People hated him. They still do. People hated him, and they hated him because he was successful. And why did they hate him? He made the world a better place. So why did they hate him? What's his sin? What's the sin of every businessman? Because no businessmen are liked. Nobody likes businessmen. What's the sin of every businessman? Well, they get rich, which means they are benefiting. Yes, everybody is benefiting from them, but they also benefit. They benefit from making the world a better place, and therefore, that's no good. But who's a saint? Who's a good guy from a moral perspective? Who would you consider like the, the model saint? What's that? Yeah, it has to be somebody who does good for no personal profit. But even better is if they do good and they suffer. suffer. They suffer. Suffering is cool. Suffering is noble. Suffering is worthwhile. So helping other people and suffering, that's beautiful. So Mother Teresa is the ideal like moral standard, right? She suffered. If you read her diary, you can find out. She had a horrible life, but she helped some people who were poor, raised them out of poverty a little bit. I mean, raised them from death to poverty. She, she had this uh, belief, very Christian belief, that you shouldn't help them go out of poverty because poverty was noble, poverty was good. Right? How many people did she help versus Bill Gates? Who helped more people? Literally, who helped more people? Bill, Bill Gates by far, not even close. Right? Not even close. Bill Gates is a villain, she's a hero. When did Bill Gates become a little bit of a hero, a little bit better? Yeah, when he left Microsoft, God forbid you actually produce and build and create stuff, employ people and, and change the world, can do that. But you can give your money away, that's good. So when he turned to philanthropy and started giving his money, left Microsoft, went to philanthropy, started giving the money away, then he became a little bit better. Why is he only a little bit better? Why isn't he a saint yet? Why isn't he a Mother Teresa yet? Because he's not suffering. The way to make Bill Gates a saint is he'd have to give up all his money, move into a tent, and bleed a little bit for us. Got to, got to see some blood, right? <laughs> then we'll have boulevards, statues. Nobody would want to be Bill Gates, but we'd all say, whoa, there's, that's noble. That's amazing. Wow. I mean, building Microsoft, eh, not so impressive, but giving it all away. You know, making the wealth, creating the wealth, and wealth is created. I think you all know that, that wealth is created. That's, uh, but giving that wealth away, that's noble, that's good, that's virtuous. You see, the whole moral code is screwed up. We live in a world, and I think it's screwed up as it's applied to capitalism, but it's screwed up in our daily lives. Because we live with this constant back and forth. On the one hand, to be good, to be noble, we need to sacrifice, but how many of you want to sacrifice? Most of you just want to live your lives. And you're constant torn between two conflicting ideas. I think it's true of our personal lives. I definitely think it's true of capitalism. Capitalism cannot be perceived as a good system, cannot be embraced by the world as long as they view it as immoral, as long as they view it as nasty and bad because it's self-interested. So I don't think we can win as long as we believe self-interest is immoral. So you have to ask the question, is self-interest immoral? What makes self-interest immoral? Where does that come from? And this, I think, is Rand, Ayn Rand's real contribution to the freedom movement, liberty movement, to, 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 to the ideas that I, think, uh, that I think drive the free market. You know, she's not an economist, she's a philosopher. She's a novelist. And she presents, I think, the only defense of self-interest as a moral endeavor, as a good. 
I mean, she's not the only one, Aristotle, if you go back and study Aristotle, Aristotle says the purpose of life is to flourish, to succeed, to be happy, eudaimonia in Greek, and uh, that here are the virtues that you should pursue, to be moral means to pursue these virtues, and it leads to success and flourishing. Ayn Rand basically says something similar. She disagrees about the virtues, the particulars, but the idea is why should I suffer for other people? Why should, why should I engage with other people with a relationship that is win-lose, where I lose? When the option is what? Win-win. And by the way, win-lose almost always turns into lose-lose. <laughs> right? In personal relationships, if one side is losing and one side is winning, it often will flip around because it, it, that's not sustainable. People don't like losing. So Rand challenges this idea in morality, this idea that, uh, that other people are the standard of morality. And instead, she offers a suggestion. She offers a philosophy, a morality that says, no, your life is the standard. Your happiness is the standard. Your success at living is the standard. And then the question is, what kind of moral values and moral virtues should you embrace in order to be successful at living? What leads to success at living? Right? Rather than the alternative, which is what leads to suffering, what leads to sacrifice, what leads to not achieving your values, but other people's values. And, and by the way, you know, the moral code that we have, what, what does it have against selfishness? What, what is the thing, when we think selfish or we think self-interested, in whatever language you want, right? What is the image that, the, the, that common morality presents to us? Who is selfish and self-interested? What's that? Yeah, so, but, but what kind of behavior do selfish people engage in? Yeah. Yeah, so they're lying, stealing, cheating. You know, they'll do anything to get their way. That's the image that we have of somebody who's self interested. Right? Rand says, really, is it really in your self interest to lie? Is it really in your self interest to cheat or to steal? Not just, you know, not only because. Most cheaters and most stealers and most liars get caught, and that creates all kinds of problems when you get caught, but also what it does to you as a human being. It's destructive. So her argument is, no, lying, cheating, and stealing, that's not selfish. It's, you know, we're presented with this alternative. You can either be, <coughs> either have an ideal of kind of be Mother Teresa, of, of sacrificing, or you could be a lying, cheating, stealing, horrible person. That, those are the two ideals. Pick. And Rand says, wait a minute, there's a third alternative. And that is to be truly self-interested, to figure out what's truly in my interest and engage with other people, not as a thief or as a liar or as a faker, but to engage with other people in win-win trade relationships. And she builds a whole moral code around this idea of trade as the essential way in which we deal with one another. And justice people treating one another based on what they deserve. And in the economic sphere, what you deserve is what you produce. So a moral code focused on individuals achieving their happiness, making their lives the best that it can be. Not succumbing to the needs of others, but succumbing to your own needs, your own real desires. And if you're concerned about your own happiness, even more fundamentally, if you're concerned about survival as a human being, just surviving, what's the most important thing you should cultivate? What, what is it that we human beings need to do in order to survive? Self-discipline. We need self-discipline, but self-discipline to do what? Right? What's, the, what's the fundamental activity we need to do in order to survive out there in nature and the world? 
We need a work, but work needs to be guided by something. This is the difference between human beings and animals. Animals also need to work in a sense, right? Cooperation, Cooperation is uh, Yuval Harari's uh, explanation. I don't know if you've heard Yuval Harari. But cooperation, yeah, it's helpful. But you need to do something before you cooperate. You need to... What makes us human? Everybody needs to eat. All animals need to eat. Who should think? Yeah, I mean, you've got to think. You've got to use your mind. I mean, animals are born with the algorithm built in to know exactly what to do in every circumstance. They've got AI right there, right? It's all pre-programmed. You know, it's, it's, it's probably not as cute as chat GPT, but it's, but it's, you know, it's all there. So a cheetah doesn't have to think. It knows that's food. I'm chasing it. I'm, I, I'm fast. I'll catch it. I'll eat it. Done. Right? There's, no, there's no consideration. There are no choices. Human beings don't have that. I, I drop you into the middle of the Amazon. You don't know what to do. You have no clue what to do. If you rely on your genes, you'll die very quickly. But you can survive. We're unbelievably good at survival. How do we survive? By thinking, figuring stuff out. So I'm in the Amazon. OK, what is poisonous? What is not? What is edible? What is not? How do I get water? You know, if water, if water is just lying there, still dangerous, might have bacteria in it. I need to get it from its flowing. Uh, maybe I should build a bow and arrow. How do you build a bow and arrow? I don't know how to build a bow and arrow. Let me figure it out. Everything we do, everything we have ever done as human beings, every value we have received, I mean, just look at this building, right? Any building, any street, any car. Are they products of what? Before we cooperate, we have to think. And, and before we communicate, we have to have something to communicate about. Again, we are not deterministic machines. We have to engage the thought process. I'm sure you all know people who don't think. I know lots of people. I would argue maybe a majority of people. They just follow. They do what other people, they let other people think and they follow. They mimic, they, 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 they uh, you know, they, they um, copy. But to really achieve anything, you have to think. You have to figure it out. You have to use your reason. You have to use your mind. You have to use your rationality. And that takes a lot of, that takes evidence. You have, to, you have to accumulate the evidence. You have to accumulate the facts. You have to integrate them. You have to come to an understanding, and then you go out into reality and you change it to fit your needs. Animals don't do that. Animals accept reality as it is, and if it's against them, they're screwed. You know, if our climate changes, what do we do? What's that? Well, we think and adapt. We, Event air conditioning, because it's a little warm, right? I mean, when, when, when we emigrated from Africa to Northern Europe and suddenly it was cold, it wasn't like, whoops, we all died, right? We figured out how to get fur. We figured out how to build homes. We figured out how to use fire to heat ourselves. We figured it out. As individuals, we figured it out. We created agriculture, hunting. Hunting requires cooperation. It requires traps. It requires weapons. It requires tools. None of that exists in nature. All of that, human beings had to create using their reason, their mind. So if you care about your own self-interest, if you want to live a great life, what should you do? Think. <laughs> Figure out what leads to a great life. Figure out how you can make your life the best that it can be. What value should you pursue to have a great life? So. To be self-interested is to be a thinker. To be self-interested is to be rational. And that means lying is kind of stupid because lying is, what does lying deal with? It deals with non-facts, anti-facts, and yet rationality requires fact, requires evidence. So you're polluting the mechanism. You know, in uh, computer science, there's a term garbage in, garbage out. If you let garbage into your mind, into this delicate mechanism, there'll be garbage out. So for Rand, 
Morality is about being self-interested, which means being a thinker, being rational, having reason, working for a living, in other words, producing. One of the reasons she argues stealing is bad for you is that we get much of our self-esteem in life, our self-confidence, and therefore our happiness from the knowledge that we can take care of ourselves, which means we can put food on the table. We can produce the things that are necessary for us to survive. When you steal, what are you admitting to yourself if to nobody else? You're unable to produce. You need other people to produce and you have to take it from them. Well, you are just an animal that uses physical force to get his stuff, get other people's stuff. And that destroys your self-esteem. So in spite of what they show in the movies, bad guys are not happy. They're miserable, pathetic. And they usually live pathetic lives. I don't know if you know this. Do you know Bernie Madoff, who Bernie Madoff was? Bernie Madoff ran the biggest pyramid scheme ever in, in America. He stole $50 billion, I think, some, some ridiculous amount like that. And when Bernie Madoff was caught, and he, he wasn't caught by the police, and he wasn't caught by the SEC, the regulators, he was caught by his sons who turned him in. Imagine being a father and your sons turn you into the police because you're a crook, how, how devastating that is to your psychology. But he said when he went to jail, he said, he said, I'm happier in jail than I was before I was caught. And the answer is, why? He says, because I couldn't look anybody in the face because I was constantly lying. I couldn't sleep at night because I was worried about being caught. I constantly had a lie to cover up my previous lies. And it was, I, I was completely dominated by stress my whole life. I couldn't, now at least it's over. I, you know, I can at least, you know, this is after his son's turned him in. So being a crook is not, is horrible. I, you know, uh, the only profession in the world where lying is, um, is, is profitable is what? Politics. <laughs> Absolutely, politics. And, and uh, have you ever met a happy politician? I have not. They all strike me as, as unbelievably miserable human beings. All of them. And the more authoritarian they are, the more miserable they are. I don't know if you've ever looked at Bill Clinton. I don't know if you know who Bill Clinton is. He just looks pathetic. He looks awful. Biden, I mean, all of them, they're horrible. Um, I, they're, they're these great pictures of Putin, actually, uh, during Christmas. Um, he wouldn't have Christmas with other people, like uh, the ceremony at the church. He wouldn't do with other people, like the, the, the um, Orthodox, Christian, uh, Orthodox Christmas. And you see him in the corner of this church in his droopy face, and he looks like the most depressed. He looks like, a, you know, you want to pet him because he looks so miserable. He looks like a puppy that's just sad. And it, but then you know why he's miserable, because he's an evil son of a bitch. So of course he's, because he's, of course he's miserable. Actually, I have a podcast, I have a YouTube channel. And on, on YouTube, I showed, I showed video of this, because there was video out there. And it, wow, he looked like the most depressed person on the planet at that point. And it, it he is, because that's what happens. Uh, you know, if you live that kind of life, there are consequences. Reality is what it is. Human beings need certain principles in order to achieve happiness. And when you negate them, you achieve the opposite. So what capitalism needs is a moral defense, a moral defense based on self-interest. What capitalism needs is a, a change in our culture where self-interest is regarded as a virtue, not a vice. Every anti-capitalist measure out there, every socialist measure out there, every redistribution measure out there, every regulatory measure out there, is a consequence of our distrust, our hatred of self-interest. Why do we redistribute wealth? Because they need it, and it's okay to sacrifice for their need. So we sacrifice you for their need, because you wouldn't do it if we didn't take the money from you. And of course, it always begins with a small group of very, very needy people, right? They really need your help. They're really struggling. But then, once that's established, and we take your money and we give it to them, now there's another group that's just a little bit less needy than the previous group, but still has needs. I mean, today in America, if you don't have an iPhone, a air conditioning, an automobile, and you know, a, a home to live in, you need welfare because you're needy, and somebody needs to sacrifice for you. That's what morality demands. 
So if I'm the government, I come to you and I say, look, I'm doing this for you. If you're wealthy, right, you have money. I, I'm doing this for your own good. I'm raising your taxes. It's, it's for your own good. You'll feel better about yourself. And, and they always couch it like this. I remember in California, they raised the, the, the state income tax on top of the federal income tax, state income tax. Uh, if, you, if you were making, I think it was more than a uh, million dollars, they raised it from 10% to 13%. And they said, look, rich people, we're doing this for the kids, right? Your money is going to go to keep schools open. If we don't raise your taxes, the schools will be closed. So we're doing it for the kids. Guess how the millionaires voted? They voted for it. They voted for raise their own taxes. If you look at the richest areas, the richest counties in the United States vote to raise their own taxes almost always because it reduces the amount of guilt they feel. Because what happens when you have a moral ideal over here and you don't live up to it? You feel guilty. Government says, look, we've got a great scheme to reduce your guilt. We'll take your money. We'll take care of the needy people. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Why do we regulate businesses? Like, why don't we trust businesses? Like, I, you know, I don't know in, in, in the Czech Republic, but in America, if you walk into an elevator, you know, elevators up and down, and there's a little, there's a little thing, there's a little thing on the wall, and it says, a government inspector inspected this elevator. Don't worry, it won't fall. I mean, it's not what it says, but that's the implication. A government inspector has to inspect every elevator in order to operate. Why? Because if the government didn't inspect the elevators, elevators would start falling constantly and killing everybody because the best way to make money is by killing your customer? If we didn't have food inspectors, McDonald's would poison us all tomorrow. That's the implication. And why do people believe that? And people do believe it. By the way, for, uh, there was a brief period of time in Georgia, you know, Georgia, the, the country, where they, had, they ab abolished food inspection. The government didn't have food inspectors, and nobody died. Surprise, surprise, businesses want to make money. And the way to make money is to keep your customers alive so they can come back and buy stuff from you. So why do we think businesses are going to poison their customers? I mean, we don't even think it. We feel it. Because they're selfish. They're self-interested. And we know that self-interested people lie, steal, and cheat, and murder, and kill, and don't care about anybody except themselves in this narrow, silly kind of way. Right? So we have a regulatory state, and we have a welfare state because of our ethics. If we want to get rid of them, we're going to have to change our ethics. So the reason we're not making progress, I believe, is because we're talking about the wrong thing. Yes, we need to educate people about economics. Yes, we need to educate people about history. Yes, we need to educate people about all the benefits capitalism provides from a material sense. But we also need to challenge their moral beliefs. We need to question where they're coming from morally. And we have to change the, moral, the morality that the culture holds. And unless we do that, we lose. And we lose all the time. And you see that. It's not going to grow until we're willing to stand up and say, no, your morality is screwed up. And it's going to take a long time. That's the other thing you have to recognize. You can change people's views in economics much easier than you can change people's views on morality. It's really, really hard. You're going up against 2,000 years of religion. You're going up against the biggest philosophers ever. You know, every one of them, with the exception of the Greeks, was kind of a, a, a pro-sacrifice. So it takes time. But the reality is that if people believe that their self-interest is a good thing and they believe that the way to achieve their self-interest is through long-term thinking, rational behavior, then do they want the government telling them what they should and shouldn't do? If I'm self-interested, if I want to live my life, what I want is to pursue my values based on my terms to achieve my happiness. Nobody gets to tell me what to do. You can encourage me, you can argue with me, but you can't tell me what to do, you can't force me. That's what self-interest means. Self-interest means I want to try my ideas, my values. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want mother, mother government sitting on my shoulder saying, 
don't drink that drink, too much sugar. I mean, if I come to the conclusion there's too much sugar, I won't drink it. But it's not their job to tell me what to do and what not to do. It's my responsibility to take care of myself. And I can do it. I have the tools to do it. I have the ability to do it. I have the mind to do it. But out of my life. A culture of people pursuing their own self-interest rationally and explicitly, knowingly, is a culture that has to accept capitalism because it's the only system consistent with that morality. What else is there? They have to accept freedom because nobody wants to be unfree if they care about their own life. The only reason we want to be unfree is because we don't care about our own life. So what we need, if we want to change the dynamics of the world, is a moral revolution. A moral revolution that rejects conventional morality and replaces it with a morality of self-interest. And as far as I know, the only philosopher to present such a morality is Ayn Rand. So read Ayn Rand, and let's get the word out there. Thank you. All right, questions. You had a question. Yes. Yeah. I have multiple, actually. <laughs> well, let's start with one. Uh, you know what? I I've, got a, I've got another mic. Let's do this. I think this is live streaming. We'll get really sophisticated here. Okay. Talk into that, and then next person who gets the mic will talk. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay, so... Uh, my initial question was about sweatshops and, uh, and the planet as a whole because uh, I agree with that uh, in a small community, yes, baker wants to m bake the best bread. Well, he, d he, d he doesn't want to make money, but for you to be happy, he wants to bake you good bread and then you'll be happy and you bu buy from him more. But in the economy we are living right now, uh, somebody is paying that extra price. Uh, the children... Do, making this shirt, we're paying the price of me buying it cheaply and being happy about it. And maybe a uh, river that is poisoned because of the colors uh, that we're... Okay, so let's take, let's take the sweatshop and we can do the mm -hmm. river afterwards. Okay. Um, okay, so there's some kid in Indonesia or Malaysia or somewhere that is working in a, a plant making uh, some ridiculously low amount of money by your standards, um, and he's making your t-shirt. Why is he there? Why is he making a t-shirt? Because he's, uh, let's assume it's not slave labor, right? We're all opposed to slave labor. We're all opposed to use physical force to pe keep people there. Why did he choose, or his parents chose, to send him to work at this factory that makes your t-shirt? Because in the end, he's better off if, if he wasn't. Because what's his alternatives? The alternative is starving. And remember, before capitalism, um, how many kids made it to age 10? What percentage of children made it to age 10, let's say, before, seven, before 1800? Anybody know what the statistic is? Less than half. Most children died before they get made it to age 10. So one possibility is uh, they start. By the way, what did children do before the Industrial Revolution and before capitalism? What did, what did children do? Worked as well. They worked. They worked in the field. Yep. Much harder jobs, by the way. Much uh, more dangerous jobs. Um, so the reason they're in the factory is because the alternatives are much, much worse. The reason they're in the factory is because if they don't work, their parents don't have enough money to feed them. So they have to contribute to the family budget so that there is money to give them food. What's really, really interesting, and there's a really good book on this uh, about sweatshops, just about sweatshops, a whole book, is that every single country that reaches a certain GDP per capita, a certain amount of income per capita, child labor disappears. Why? Because they don't need to. Because as soon as the parents start making enough money, where they can feed the child without the child working, they take him out of the factory and send him to school. So again, you know, I would encourage you to buy more t-shirts from that factory. 
because you want more children working there so that they don't die and they don't have to work in the fields where they're, they're paid even less so that ultimately, uh, you know, as they become more productive, as these economies become more productive, their parents who have other jobs will make even more money and will pull the kids out. Okay. But it's more than that, right? Those children who work in the factory, let's say at age 10, 12, 14, you know, we'd rather they be in school, but that's not really an option here. But they're learning a skill. They're learning to be on time. They're getting a wage. They're, they're learning to do a job. Many of them are going to become more and more productive. And many of them are going to be much more successful than their parents were because now they've learned a skill from very early on and they've grown with that skill. So in my view, sweatshops have created massive opportunities. Again, I'm excluding slave labor. If they're chained to the machine, it doesn't count. But assuming they're doing it out of at least their parents' free will. Yeah, Siri, shut up. <laughs> Siri does not understand. Uh, Slavery. Yeah. It's like the PC police, right? It's, 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 uh, it's not just the National Security Agency listening in. It's also, it's also the woke. Uh, uh, so we have, so it's not only that, um, that this child's other options are worse than this, and you're doing him, you're actually adding value to his life by employing him. Now, again, these ultimately, as societies get richer, children stop working. And by the way, countries always pass laws banning child labor uh, a few months after there's pretty much no child labor left or when there's a very, very small amount of child labor. They don't do it before because the parents would get upset and children might die of starvation. They do it after, and then they get the credit. If you look at Western history, Child labor laws always pass after child labor is gone. But if you talk to your socialist or, or status friends out there, they'll all tell you, oh, no, government saved the children. No. Capitalism saved the children. Sure, economics saved the children. Self-interest saved the children, the self-interest of the parents who don't want their kids in a factory. They want them in school. Okay, and isn't it my self-interest to have the cheapest T-shirt available? Yeah. Buy him as many as you can. Uh, isn't the, that, and the children have more opportunities as a consequence yeah, of that. Yeah, isn't that keeping uh, or No, because, uh, uh, because the kids are there, not because mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the owner of the factory wants to keep them there. The kids are there because it's their best opportunity that they have. And competition for labor is going to drive their wages up, not down. The more productive they become, their wages will go up. The, the reality is that as the standard of living in the world goes up, your T-shirt will get more expensive. Yep. But, but you don't have any control over that. That just is what it is. And by the way, sweatshops might be in Indonesia right now, but where's the next place the sweatshops are going to be? Africa. Africa. And that's a beautiful thing for Africa. Because that'll mean Africa's on the way to rising economically. Mm -hmm when you have start having factories there, when you, have, when you have children not working in the fields anymore, working in factories, their productivity just went up. They, and in that sense, they're producing more. And as their parents become richer, they will be, go to school and Africa will become relatively rich. That's the path every single country goes through. And if you're going to ask about the polluted rivers in Indonesia, it's mm -hmm. exactly the same thing. You've got to pollute to become rich. No shortcuts. In England, in the 19th century, during the Industrial Revolution, they burnt huge quantities of coal. And if you'd said at the time, stop, you're polluting. Pe Literally, people were getting sick. It's not pretend sick, real yeah. sick. They were breathing the coal in. They were getting black lung or whatever, horrible things. If you'd stopped it because of that and said, no, we can't have pollution, you would have killed the Industrial Revolution and killed all of the progress we've had over the last 200 years. China, in order to get to become middle class, to go from, you know what percentage of the Chinese population was $2 a day or less in, um, when Mao Zedong died? 1976, I think that was. Like 90-something percent. It was one of the poorest places on planet Earth. Today, hundreds of millions of people are middle class or above. I mean, you go to Shanghai, you go to some of these cities, now, they're still poor people, but the percentage in extreme poverty is less than 10%, well less than 10%. How did that happen? 
It happened by producing stuff as cheaply as they could on, on a massive scale. Did that involve pollution? Absolutely. You couldn't see the sun in Beijing. Now that they're rich, what are they doing? Relatively rich. What are they doing? <laughs> Exporting pollution elsewhere to Africa. No, now they're cleaning it up. Okay. Are they cleaning it up at home? And when Africa, this is the whole point about, this is mm -hmm. also the whole point about fossil fuels, which we'll get to in a minute. You know, now they're cleaning China up. And yes, the pollution will go to Africa. Because Africa will need to industrialize. Yep. As Africa industrialize, it won't be able to put those fancy filters on. It won't be able to have lots of cleaning, processing plants, because they're expensive. They won't have the capital to do it. So in order to get rich, you have to go through a period of child labor. You have to go through a period of dirt, filth, pollution. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, when you're rich, you clean it up. And yes, some people are going are gonna to be hurt by it. But the alternative is not to industrialize. And if you don't industrialize, you stay poor. Well, and people suffer much more if they stay poor. So pollution is a cost of progress. Progress is not zero cost. It's a cost of progress. You want progress, you're going to have to pollute for a while. There's no way to take the clean technology we have today and give it to Africa and say, run with it, because they can't afford to use it. And this is the problem mm -hmm. with alternative energy and fossil fuels. We all think, we all imagine, Oh, the Industrial Revolution in Africa will happen with, with uh, 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 you know, I don't know, windmills and solar panels. They can't, you can't make enough of them. They're not reliable enough. And the reality is that they're too expensive. It's much cheaper to build a little power plant with natural gas or with oil. And they need to be cheap because they're poor. <laughs> and they can't compete unless they are cheaper than everybody else. So if you, if you deny fossil fuels from Africa, you deny them the ability to develop and progress. We the rich, we can afford, I, you know, you Slovakians can put out, you know, lots of solar panels all over the place. You won't get any electricity because the sun never shines here, but <laughs> you'll feel good about yourselves because you tried. <laughs> I mean, I, I go to Germany and I see these massive, fields of solar panels. And I go, these people live here. Don't they know there's no sunshine in Germany? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's insanity. I understand California. I live in Puerto Rico. We have sunshine every day, right? But Germany? England? Have you ever been in London? It's like gray all the time. <laughs> You're not going to get solar panels. So anyway, so the point is, that's how progress happens. Mm -hmm. And there are no shortcuts. It's more about the uh, Ayn Rand and uh, her work. So, yeah. wh where would you suggest to begin with, uh, like reading and uh, learning about? So, so um, I would say I would say it depends on to some extent it depends on you, right? So, if you like fiction, and I hope everybody likes fiction because fiction is amazing, there are stories. Then I would start with The Fountainhead, which is a, a fictional book. But it is an expression of her morality. It's about an architect and his struggles to build the kind of buildings that he believes in, the kind of art, the kind of architecture that, that he is committed to, and the struggles he has in, 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 uh, in, in, in building those. Um, and his relationship with other people, and it's very much about this morality of self-interest versus morality focused on other people. If you're more interested in kind of uh, the, the big, uh, still interested in stories, but interested in more big time politics, state of the world, what's going on in the world, I would recommend Atlas Shrugged. Bigger book, thicker book, thicker story, which really deals with the state of the world and, and, and what makes the world run and what happens when, when you want to stop the world from running. You know? uh, um, so it's a, a fascinating book and, it, and philosophy is more developed in that book. If you're interested in nonfiction, Right? If you don't like fiction, if you don't it's like stories. Just that with that last shrug, it's like what we say is that what we live it now, so it has become a documentary of some sort. Yes. So Atlas shrugged a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, but, but, we, but you know, Ayn Rand heard that in the 1970s in America. People were saying, but it's happening right now. Uh, during the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009, it was happening right now. Right now, it's happening right now. It, it seems to always be happening right now. 
what's really amazing for me, and, and a lot of us who've been studying Iron Man for a long time, is how resilient our world is, that in spite of, uh, you know, in spite of all the bad things, we still keep going somehow. Um, if you're interested in nonfiction, then uh, a few books uh, I'd recommend of essays. All her nonfiction book, or most of her nonfiction books, are, are books of essays. So I, I'd recommend Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, where she talks about her views of capitalism. And the other one is The Virtue of Selfishness, which is what we talked about a little bit today, but where she developed, there it is, there's The Virtue of Selfishness. And where she talks about a, a morality of self-interest. What is a morality of, of self-interest constituted? How do you live the best life that you can live? What, what morality is structured around that? So I would, uh, I would definitely look into that, and he's got a copy of the book there, so you can, you can take a look at that. Other questions? Yeah, back there. Uh, I'm currently reading uh, Atlas Tract. Oh, good. And uh, there is a nice example of uh, uh, Francesco uh, cheating with the uh, San Sebastian mines. Yeah. And I'm just curious, uh, in, in this case, he increased the value of his uh, um, company yeah. by decreasing the value of others because th they were cheated on San Sebastian mine. And I think, isn't it the reason that uh, a lot of s the merit of society thinks that the capitalism is immoral, that uh, part of the people are creating, are trying to fulfill their, their self-interest, not by creating a value, but by cheating uh, of others and decreasing their value. So yeah, so I'm not going to answer the question as it refers to Francisco because I don't want to spoil the novel for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I did, didn't. Uh, so I, you're yeah. going to discover why he did what he did and what the reason is for it. And he's not, a, he's not the bad guy. He's the good guy. OK. So, so, <laughs> so, so you'll see why he does what he does and, and how it all turns out. But I'm not going to tell you because that is the big spoiler, right? There's a huge spoiler alert. Um, but yes, I do think that there are businessmen like Bernie Madoff and, and other businessmen. Bernie Madoff's a guy with a pyramid scheme who do cheat their customers, who do do bad things. I think they suffer for it, but that definitely gives a bad reputation to businessmen. But the interesting thing is, people have the bad rep businessmen have the bad reputation even before they cheat. And when they cheat, what happens is, what happens inside our head is, yeah, I knew it. Th that's what they are. They're all like that. I remember in 2002, now you guys are too young to, to, to know any of this, and it's also in America. But during the late 1990s and early 2000s, there were a lot of cases of fraud in America. So uh, Enron uh, and a few other companies all, what's that? WorldCom. WorldCom, Enron, WorldCom, and there were a few others all, by the way, in heavily regulated industries, uh, telecom and, and uh, electricity, Enron, um, all committed fraud. And there were like four or five of them. They were big, and it was big in the news. And, and Bill O'Reilly, I don't know if you know who Bill O'Reilly is, but Bill O'Reilly used to be the biggest guy on Fox. He used to be more, bigger than Tucker Carlson is today, but he was bigger than Tucker Carlson is today. So he was the biggest guy on Fox. And he had me on his show because he said all CEOs, all businessmen are crooks. We should fire all of them. And I went on the show and said, some of them are crooks. We should fire the ones that are crooks. But you can't, you can't accuse people of being bad people without any evidence. You don't know. I mean, it's ridiculous. What about the CEO of your company, right? Somebody, uh, somebody runs Fox. They employ you. You wouldn't have a job without the business people who create the business opportunities for it. He didn't like it. He got really mad and got very, very angry. But... Um, that's the instinct people have, because it comes from that view of self-interest equals lying, cheating, stealing. So if one of you does it, one businessman does it, then you go, yeah, they must all be like this. So it confirms the bias we already have. But yes, it makes it more difficult. Yeah, but uh, is there any, any way how to motivate people to fulfill their self-interest by uh, creating a value and not uh, cheating? Be yes. Because cheating is so the often, two ways. often easier, isn't it? Two ways. One. Teach them that cheating hurts them, is not in their self-interest at all, ever. Uh, and two, put the bastards in jail when they do it. That is, have clear laws for fraud, catch them, put them in jail, make them, penalize them so you think in advance, I don't want to go to jail, so you, you don't cheat, right? Uh, so one is a positive, 
don't cheat because there are better things to do, right? For your own self-interest. And then one's a negative, don't cheat because you'll go to jail if you do. Yeah, let me get you the mic. Thank you. Um, if I may have a point for a discussion, that's something I won't uh, make a disclaimer. I agree with everything that you have said. But Yet, I do have a. So, so um, when you were talking about the, the morality and the, the Kant, uh, Kant uh, philosophy, one thing that struck me that was yes, there are certain philosophers that promote that you have to do stuff with the. With the selfless stuff without your happiness in it to be moral. Yep. But I think that the, the underlying principle of why the socialism is much more successful than us, unfortunately, but that's how I view it, is that they have made a better case for the morality of, of their cause. So, for example, they are not saying that you should serve the, the, the person like the, the, the guy who makes bread, the baker. Uh, he makes uh, the bread, and you said he is happy to do it. But their claim is that not necessarily, because people, be because of the consumerism, are not always happy with the jobs that they have. And they say that if we promote non-consumerism, we can do stuff to be happy and help other people as well. And the same goes for the, for the uh, uh, I think it was sweatshops as well, but I forgot my point there. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I mean, yeah. What the socialists say about sweatshops is, well, we're rich. We should just pay the kids not to be in the sweatshop. We should just take all our wealth and give it to their parents and make sure that they don't go into the sweatshops. But of course, if you do that, your wealth won't last for very long. You can do that for a year. Maybe you can do that for two years. You can't do it for all the kids. You know, for some kids, and some kids will suffer. But so, so yeah. So they Marx's claim is that when you become an employee of a company, you get alienated from the means of production, you get alienated from your life, and, you, and, and this is suffering, and today uh, they call it wage slavery. Wage slavery, right? But again, what this does is, first of all, it takes agency away from you. It basically says you don't know what's good for you. You're, 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 you're forced into this job. No, you're not. You can take other jobs. You can go back to the farm. You can do a million other different things. So I'm saying figure out what's truly in your self-interest. And if this is job is the best that you can do, then go for it. Then it's not exploitation and it's not alienation. It's the best option you have for you. Um, so they deny the idea of, of individual, individual agency, moral agency. They think we are constantly and um, uh, manipulated and uh, that we are determined and therefore exploited by other people, that we don't determine our own fate. So that's one uh, thing they do very well, which undermines, uh, undermines. But again, I think that, that works on people because we haven't taught them to live for themselves, because they have this morality back there, this, these principles of living which they don't really want to do, so they're torn, and then somebody comes to them and says, yeah, and they're exploiting you, and they're taking advantage of you, and that fits right into this whole idea of I'm living this conflict. Um, and then the other thing, uh, what was the other thing that I want to say about the socialist um, and the labor is Fundamentally, what Marx is doing is he's rejecting, he's rejecting moral agency of the individual, but he's also rejecting the human mind. Um, so Marx explicitly rejects reason. We're all determined. We're determined by a class. We're determined by genes, in other words. We're determined by social circumstances. We don't shape our own lives. We're not in control of our own self-interest. Um, so if you're born to a worker, you are a worker, and therefore, you know, and, and, and others will just exploit you in order to get their way. And again, there's this negative image of self-interest. It's a capitalist self-interest to exploit you. So he's leveraging 
I, I think he's leveraging Christianity. He's leveraging the whole idea of sacrifice. Um, he's also, uh, you know, pre everything's predetermined, predestined. History is predestined, predetermined. There's no choice. There's no agency. There's nothing. So I think what Marx does and what the socialists do is they exploit our current understanding of morality and of deeper philosophy, epistemology, of whether we have free will or not. And they exploit that for their agenda. And what we do is we don't have a positive case to argue against. That's the challenge. We don't have something to inspire people. We don't say, no, you're not being exploited. Just take the job. Make the most of it. Live you know, learn, grow, become better, make, you know, make your life into something. You are responsible for your own life. You are your own agent. You have agency. You have free will. Libertarians, unfortunately, because it's such a big tent, and they don't want to offend anybody's philosophy under the tent, they don't reject the idea of altruism. They don't reject the idea of predetermination. They don't reject the ideas of, of self-sacrifice which are so embedded, for example, in Christianity, because they want to keep the big tent. But I think that unless we challenge those philosophical ideas that Marx builds on, Marx comes after Hegel and Kant, and Marx builds on Hegel and Kant. He's, it's not just, he doesn't come out of nowhere. He comes from a particular intellectual tradition, and we have to challenge that intellectual tradition. Otherwise, we can be successful. Ideas, particularly deep philosophical ideas, are what ultimately shape our culture. It's not economics and politics. That's what I, uh, what, what I meant. We, we are doing, a, just as you have said at the beginning, we are doing a terrible job at the, the, the philosophical part. Yeah. And yeah. I agree with everything. And I think that everything that they are saying, of course, is the end. But, yeah. but they're good at it. But they are very good. Yes. Because when they always come with these new problems. And they stigmatize people, for, for example, LGBTIQ. Then you have environmentalism. <laughs> Come with it. They are aggressive, but we, as the right wingers or libertarian, don't necessarily. Yeah, but notice, them. notice, for example, LGBTQ. And again, I'm pro LGBTQ. I mean, I, I don't, I don't care. It's your life. Do whatever you want with it. That's the whole point, right? But the way they do it is, do you know this concept of intersectionality? It's a, it's an academic concept that's in America, but it's spread now all over Europe and certainly in the UK. It's the idea that we rank people based on how oppressed they are. <laughs> so if you're, you know, black and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, homosexual and trans and, I don't know, you abused as a you're then you are the best. Everybody, in a sense, should, should sacrifice to you because you're the most oppressed. And intersectionality, basically, in a sense, not in a sense, gives you a rating based on the color of your skin, your gender, how oppressed you are, how privileged. You know the term privilege? Everybody talks about privilege. I hate that term. But how privileged you are and how oppressed you are. And there's a pyramid. And the whole idea is, and this is the altruism, this is the morality, the whole idea is those who are privileged must sacrifice to those who are oppressed. So it's not about economics anymore. It's not about class, rich, poor, sacrifice the rich to the poor. Now it's about all these other dimensions of oppression. Sexuality, sex, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, color skin. But it's all built on a foundation of, we should sacrifice. It's all built on the foundation of, I can't help myself. Other people need to sacrifice for me. And your life doesn't belong to you, because if somebody oppressed over there, you need to help them. That's your moral duty, is to help them. Not to take care of yourself, but to help them. So the whole intersectionality is this idea of altruism, otherism, on steroids. Because it's taken a different, you know, they've been very creative. When the economic stuff, like classes don't really exist anymore. You know, who's the working class? Uh, you know, when, when AI is going to come about and robots take jobs, we're all going to be knowledge, we're all going to be doing stuff that is, that is not traditional working class jobs, it, it, classes have kind of become unsexy. So they're looking for other places in which they create similar hierarchies of sacrifice. The environment is exactly the same thing. I don't know, there's these poor animals, poor little worms and insects, and what you're doing is harming them. So you as a human being should sacrifice to them. So we should slow our economic growth. 
We should slow the nice buildings we want to build, the nice, so that the womb can have a good life. And it's okay to sacrifice. That's moral. The moral thing is to sacrifice for, quote, nature. So they're constantly looking because, this, you know, God is gone. At least for much of the West, God is gone. So we're not sacrificing God anymore. That was religion. Religion was, you're nothing. Your purpose in life is to sacrifice to him. Or now you're not supposed to say God is a him. To him, her, right? Um, there's the Church of England just announced that they are considering uh, uh, the gender reference to God. Because, you know, even, even though... The, anyway. Um, so God, the sacrifice to God is, is, is gone. So... Uh, Mark said sacrifice to proletarian. Um, the, the, you know, the LGBTQ sacrifice to whoever is oppressed. And now it's sacrifice to nature. Human beings should sacrifice to nature. Stop progress. Stop building. Stop creating. Because everything we do, and this is true, everything we do impacts nature. Because this is the difference between human beings and animals. We got this earlier, right? Animals, if, change, if nature changes, what, ha what happens to animal? It dies. We change nature. Like we chop down trees and build huts. We blow up mountains and build highways. We, you know, we, 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 we redirect rivers to, to water our agriculture. We create reservoirs to get water. The way in which human beings survive, the means by which we survive, is to change our environment. To tell us not to change the environment is to say human beings die. Because there's no other way for human beings to survive other than to change their environment. So the anti, you know, so again, this is all about sacrifices. It's all about your interest have to be subservient to, fill in the blank. We'll have a sexy new thing for you to sacrifice for tomorrow. And the opposition to that should be, no, <laughs> we're not sacrificing. Why should we? We want to live. We love life. We're going to do whatever it takes to live a successful life. To hell with you. And, but we need to be able to articulate that in a philosophical way that challenges all of their premises. Any other questions? Please go one more. I would like to ask in case of env environmentalism, let's say that, that w the part of the people want to sacri sacrifice the progress in, to achieve, uh, to achieve like, uh, na na nature preservation and so yeah. on. And let's say that we don't want to do it, yeah. but in long-term point of view, uh, didn't it uh, destroy our society? Like there is a small possibility that the enormous uh, increasing in progress in current situation can uh, destroy the progress itself, like from point of the, the global yeah. warming yeah. and so yeah. on. So. Yeah. so and decrease our happiness in three generations from now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what's your opinion about it? Like, uh, like. Well, I think it's 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 all wrong and it's framed wrong. The problem is framed wrong. Um, you don't. If you can show me that there's a better way for me to live that'll that it, that is more uh, contributing more to my happiness and my success as a human being, then fine. But for you to come and say. Um, in three generations now, people will be less happy. How do you know? I don't Reality know. is, and I, I use my 19th century example again, imagine if in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, people said, you're using too much coal. This coal is killing people. You've got to stop now, because three generations from now, they'll all die. Well, it turns out three generations from now, they were all doing great, and thank God that nobody stopped them back then, and uh, let's hope that nobody stops us now, because our grandkids... Now, this is the other thing about it. But if, if we have progress, how rich will three generations from now be? Super rich compared to us, right? How rich are, are we than our great-grandparents? Super rich. Um, can super rich deal with problems that you can't? Yeah. Well, let them deal with the problems then. Since I don't know, you're saying I don't know. If you knew then fine, if you know this is the crisis, this is the problem, this is what's gonna happen, maybe we can do something about it. But if you don't know, then let, let future generations deal with it. Because they'll be so much richer, have so many more resources, have better science and better technology, they'll be able to deal with it. 
So the best way how to focus on long term, uh, long term progress is to make myself rich, to uh, optimize and to uh, increase the possibility of uh, of future generation to have a better scientific uh, approach. The to best, the the best way to deal with, with the problems of the world is for everybody to get rich. Yes. Yeah, it's a good argument. Thank you. And it's and it's not that hard because if you take you can do this exercise at home if you want. You can do it in your, calc in your, on your iPhone right now. Let's, let's, um, let's, assume, um, let's assume that if we had real free markets in, um, in, uh, in Slovakia, you could achieve, I don't know, 6% real economic growth a year for the next 40 years. I think that's reasonable. I don't think that's science fiction. If you had real free markets, not the idiocy we have today, right? 6% growth for 40 years. Now, let's also assume that wages approximately rise at the same rate as, as economic growth, which is true because economic growth increases productivity and wages rise with productivity. So do 1.06, I don't know if you're opening up your calculator, but do 1.06 to the power of 40. What's that? Can somebody do 1.06 to the power of 40. Yeah, you can't do it in your head. <laughs> what is it? 10.3. Okay, 10.3. Let's say it's 10.3, right? So let's say, what's, what's, what's a low wage in Slovakia today? Euros? A, a year, sorry. A, an, annual, an annual wage in, in Slovakia today. Well, let's do before taxes because, you know, I can't, I can't you know, well, let's, let's go for it. Like so let's say 10,000, because it's a round number. 10,000 euros a month, uh, a year, is, is, a, is, is like a poor person, is what a poor person makes in, in Slovakia. Okay, now multiply that by 10. Now they're making 100,000. Are you poor in Slovakia on $100,000? No. So in 40 years, there's not a single poor person in Slovakia. Fair to say? Because maybe somebody's making only 8,000, but they're now they're making 80,000. So there's no poor people left. And, and that solves all your... Now, they're poor people, relatively speaking, because some people will be even richer, some people will make millions. But the poorest person on an absolute basis is now in real terms, because we said real economic growth, not in, so we've adjusted for inflation. They're making 100,000 real euro. There's no poor people, so the, poverty, the problem of poverty is gone. And, and that's what's at stake. So the biggest beneficiaries of capitalism are, are going to be the poor people. They struggle to barely survive, and they could be rich. 100,000 euro. You can do a lot of stuff with 100,000 euro. And that's what we don't explain to people, is the solution of poverty is not the welfare state. It's not charity. It's not giving away. It's not sacrifice. It's economic growth. And the faster we grow, that's what China discovered, right? How did it go from 90% of their people in extreme poverty to now less than 10%? Economic growth. They grow 12%. You know, if you grow 12%, it happens much, much faster than 40 years. But, and, and what leads to economic growth? Markets. Free markets. Get rid of the regulations, get rid of the taxation, liberate it, and you get this explosive economic growth and nobody's poor anymore. And the same, and, and then again, when, when people are rich, what do they do? They like to clean up their environment. They like to have nice parks. They like to, you know, pay people to pick up the trash. They like to make sure the air is clean because now they can afford to have clean air and clean rivers and clean all this. And it doesn't cost them that much because they're rich. So being rich solves a lot of problems in life. You know, people who tell you money doesn't buy you happiness are lying to you. Of course, money buys you happiness. Not having money certainly makes happiness difficult. Now, money doesn't guarantee you happiness, but it certainly is part of being happy. Right? Can I have one last question? Sure. If any, anybody. Uh, last year I was uh, at LibertyCon in Prague. It was like a conference of 
libertarians. I've spoken at Liberty Con many times. Yeah, yeah, I, not yeah. last so, year. So, yeah. yeah, but th there, there was a there was a guy uh, which had a presentation uh, in which he claimed that Jesus was a capitalist at at principle. Uh, yeah. Would you argue with him, or would you agree with him? Uh, what, I mean, I, I, I think this is why we lose. It's because, um, <laughs> it, it, because we, we try to make ridiculous arguments, and we try, we try not to be too controversial. We try to be uh, mainstream. You know, we, we, you know, give up on Jesus. He, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. No, a, a I'm religion. not saying to you. I'm saying generally. Um, <laughs> The Sermon on the Mount is socialist. The Sermon on the Mount is socialist. It's about sacrifice. It's the meek shall inherit the earth. It's, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than, than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know, yes, you can find other statements, but these statements also exist. I mean, the beauty of the Bible, any religious text, New Testament, Old Testament, Quran, doesn't matter, is you can find whatever you want in it. Stop looking. You know, you know, we have to stop looking for the past. We have to stop looking at what is conventional because what is conventional has led to where we are today. It's led to socialism and statism and, and the conventional mixed economy. We need something radical and new. And it's not radical to, to hold on to Jesus and not let him go. It's time to let him go. Jesus taught a bad morality. Jesus' morality is wrong. It's bad. It's no good. Because it tells you that life on this earth is not that important because it tells you that life on this earth is meant to, is, is, you, should be, you should sacrifice. In religion generally, you know, God comes to Abraham and says, take your kid and kill him. Do you know this story? But uh, I've met with the organizer and we need to slowly finish. And okay, so this, this is it, yeah. And what I'm proposing to finish this and then like to continue this session. Sure. See, I got a religion and he's shutting me down. No free speech even at SFL. Um, I, wanted to talk, I wanted to like conclude it with like this like very nice and radical end point. But also, um, I'm Marcus and I'm uh, head of civil activism for Liberty and I'm very happy that you all came. We have some merch down there and also like the cashier if you want to support us. Please take the merch, it's heavy. I don't want to take it with me. Please take it, join the book. And it's for my self-interest, so I don't want to take it. Absolutely. Happy to come back. Thank you.